come with your presence Lord this morning and speak a word in season to our hearts this morning we come for the proceeding word for the letter killeth but the spirit giveth life your word says that he that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness but strong meat belongs to those who by reason of use have exercised their senses to discern good and evil let the discernment that comes by exercise be made available this morning by the power of jesus name and everybody shouted amen, amen. god bless you before you take your seat we honor the word of god psalm number 68 We're reading only the verse number one let god arise and let his enemies be scattered let them also that hate him flee before him amen i'm beginning a new series this morning entitled enemies other than the devil enemies other than the devil in other words what the preacher is trying to bring to your notice in the coming weeks is that the devil is not your only enemy okay put it that way the devil is not your only enemy amen but this morning the sub the, the, the sub topic which is the introduction is what I have entitled even God has enemies that is the subtop. Even God has enemies. Oh, so for me, dear, we are saying today in my obi, I'm not be Even God, touch your neighbor. Even God. I don't like the way you are. I said, touch them. Don't touch, touch. Coronavirus is passed. Touch them. Even God has what <laughs> enemies. Now, before I begin, let me help all of us understand something that will confuse because after this service if i don't tackle this at the beginning it is likely that after service people will come with questions so i have already brought your question before i begin the topic question one pastor has the bible not said that love your enemies matthew 5 the verse number 43 to 45 you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy next verse but i i say to you love your enemies bless those who curse you do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you that you may that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his son rise on evil and on good and sends rain on the just and the unjust now if we get to this verse 45 it means that you are loving your enemy praying for your enemy blessing those that curse you so that you will maintain a consistency in your character as a child of god D did you see that now he said that you may so you are doing verse 43 verse 44 because of verse 45 can we agree on that so it means that you'll be consistent in what your character are you following all right so i have a question on this verse today i'm doing the thinking on the pulpit so as i'm preaching i'm thinking so what happened to judas <laughs> i like the way you're looking at my <laughs> what it, it, it's Jesus that is saying this true or false? Oh, come on, talk now. The question I want to ask is so, what happened to Judas? Because 
Judas walked with Jesus for three years and betrayed him for 30 pieces. So for every year it was 10, 10 pieces every year. As a matter of fact, he betrayed Jesus not with a Facebook post to show or throw shades. He betrayed Jesus with a kiss. A kiss is a sign of affection, but Judas decided to use the sign of affection as a sign of betrayal. Simply put, it is not everybody that is kissing you that is expressing affection. Sometimes the kisses of men are the betrayal to your grave. What happened to Judas? Matthew 26, 24. I want, I'm taking my time to build a, a very important case. Matthew 26, 24. Now, Jesus is talking about the man that will betray him. And let's look at what Jesus said. Matthew 26, 24. The son of man indeed goes out as it is written of him. Watch this now. But woe. Now, if you are an account speaker or a key speaker, because dear means that your conclusion has, has come. Die, it means that we are not thinking what will happen to you. What must happen to you has been finished. You are just waiting to manifest it. So now, Jesus is saying, but woe unto the man by whom the son of man is betrayed. Watch this now. It will have been good for that man if he had not been born. So my question is, if the word of God is saying in Matthew chapter 5, verse 42, 43, 44, 45, that we should bless those that curse us and pray for those that persecute us, why is Jesus saying this about Judas? Simply put, let me end your dilemma. There are different enemies in the Bible. Don't confuse every enemy as the same. We will get there. So, by the time I end this message, somebody will come to me and, oh, man of God, the Bible says love your enemies. There are different kinds of enemies. Write it down. Different kinds. Before you confuse yourself. You cannot bless a Judas. <laughs> the problem with many people is, they give Judas an opportunity back into their lives with a very distorted theology that tells them to love their enemies. But in the series to come, I'm going to show you that all enemies are not in the same class. So if you walk around with love your enemies, you will die before your time. There is the Judas class of enemies. There is the Pharisaic class of enemies. They, they are the Sadducee class of enemies. They are the enemies that come from the scribes. They are household enemies. A man's enemy shall be of his own house. How, how many enemies have I even mentioned now? So it will be an exercise in futility to confuse all these enemies as they say. There are some enemies. So, do you know that there are some people who fasted and said that until Paul dies, they will not, they will not eat. You are looking at my face. Hey, my main country. Mumu will bring problem, no, no. Nyamesi and Tanfo. Was that Tanfo Ben or Okano? Because they are classes. It is Jesus that said we should pray for our enemy. My question is why did Jesus not pray for Judas? Watch this. Watch this. And when it was that day, some of the Jews, who are the Jews? Paul, was Paul a Jew? Was Paul a Jew? Yes. He was a Jew. Watch this. 
bound together and bound themselves under an oath. They swore an oath. They swore an oath. What did they say in the oath? Saying that they will neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. How do you expect Paul to pray for this enemy? Somebody is planning to kill you. You want to pray for them. Thank you very much. Sir. There are different classes. That's what I'm saying. Of enemies. Now, let us define love properly. Now, the Bible said, love your enemies. Was it in the Bible? The question I want to ask is that love can be confused if you don't study it in context. Write it. Love is confusing if it is not studied in context. If you don't apply love in context, you make mistakes. Now, point number one. John chapter 3 verse 16. John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting what? Oh, come on, talk to me. Have everlasting one. First John 2. The verse 15. First John 2. The verse 15. There's a problem here. John 3.16, bring it back. John 3.16. 3.16. For God so loved the world. Is it there? First John 2. Verse 15. Confusing. John 3.16 said God loved the world. First John 2.15 is saying God is telling us that we should not love the world. What is the problem? The first John 3.16, write it. The first John 3, the first, the first scripture, John 3.16, is love that leads to salvation. I'm teaching John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. For what? So that we have eternal life. So that love leads to salvation. But 1 John 2.15, that love leads to destruction. So you can love to salvation and you can love to destruction. Many people are in love with people who will kill them. It does not negate the element of love. But that love will lead you to hell. <laughs> Come on now. So it, the problem is not, it's not the love. The problem is the context of the love. John 3.16 is the love that brings men to salvation. But First John 2.15 says, Love not the world or the things in the world, for all that there is in the world, the pride of, of life, the last of the eyes, the last of... He says, all these things will lead you to what? Hell. So if you say, love your enemies, are you loving the enemies to salvation? Or you are loving the enemies to destruction. Is somebody following me this morning? Alright, sit down. Um, how, how does loving the enemies to salvation, how does it work? I'm going to use three minutes to explain. How many of you know the apostle called Paul? How many of you know him? The first time Paul enters the Bible... Is when they were stoning Stephen in Acts chapter number 7. The Bible said, the men that were, I, I'm showing you something, the men that were lynching Stephen, they took off their shirt so that the blood will not spill in the shirts or their clothes. And the word said, they put it under the feet of a man. So there was a man that if you wanted to stone Stephen, you take off your shirt or whatever you were wearing, and you bring it under his feet. So he was the one supervising the killing of Stephen. That particular man is called Saul. Who became Paul the apostle. In Acts chapter 7 verse 59 and 60. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man called who? It's called who? Next verse. Next verse. And they stoned Stephen 
as he was calling on God and saying, watch this now. Watch the prayer of Stephen. He said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Next verse, 16. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. He said what? He said what? Lord, do what? Do not charge them with this sin. Then he said this and fell what? Asleep. This is the love that will lead to salvation. Did you see in verse 58 that Saul was the supervisor? Did you see it? Come, did you see it? All right. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. <laughs> the verse number 3. Yeah, from 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At this time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Next verse. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Next verse. As for Saul, the same guy. So we find in him as 758. We find in him as 78 verse 3. He said, as for Saul, he made havoc of what? Entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to where? Committing them to where? But do you still remember the prayer of Stephen? Come on, talk to me. Do you remember the prayer of Stephen? He said, Father, lead him not to what? Their charge. Galatians 1.13. I'm, I'm building a case here. Galatians 1.13. Verse 13. This is Paul now talking about his issue in the past. Let's look at what he said. He said, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to what? So how did he survive? Because he was an at this point you should know that Paul was an enemy true or false? Come on talk to me. True or false? The question is how did he survive? The survival was built on the premise of the prayer of Stephen. Do not lay it to what? Come on, somebody talk. Do not lay it to what? Do not lay it to his what? So, th that is what I'm saying. There is a love that leads. So, if Paul, watch this now, did not have the encounter in Acts chapter 9, the charge... The charge would have still been laid on his account. So, how do I know? First Timothy, let me end, let me end this. First Timothy, let, let me quickly jump to that part. First Timothy, chapter number one, the verse number 13. Aha, uh -huh, watch this now. Can you bring King James? You see. Who was before a blasphemer? He's talking about himself. A, perse a, pe a persecutor. An injurious. But I obtained mercy because of what? They are ignorant enemies. That's what I'm saying. All that I'm saying is that there are different categories of enemies. The ones that will walk into salvation are what we call ignorant enemies. So even though Paul was doing all these things against the church, he was doing it according to this verse in the ignorance of his unbelief. So what he was doing was that he thought he was defending God by killing God's people, but that was an expression of ignorance. So we have ignorant enemies. These are men who have become weapons in the hands of the devil to attack God, to attack his people, and to attack church. They are not the same as the sons of the devil. I'm teaching deep. Very, very deep. Now, <laughs> now, 
How many of you remember the prayer of Jesus on the cross? Father, forgive them. For they know not what what they do. Now, this is my question. The reason why Jesus said God should forgive them is because they didn't know what they were doing. True or false? My question to you, man of God, is that what will be the prayer of Jesus if they know what they are doing? You see, don't quote scriptures anyhow. And, and, the, the word said, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they want. They are doing. Stephen said, don't lay it to their charge. Paul said, I did it ignorantly. Now, in Acts chapter 17, the Bible says, in the days of ignorance, the Lord forgave. So, forgiveness is connected to ignorance. But a man practicing evil with knowledge is not ignorant. So if a man sits in the house and decides to bring the destinies of family members and put it in a bottle and seal it and say, nobody will come out of this bottle until I say so. Do not go and pray and say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do because he is operating by knowledge. I prophesy, may God open your eyes to see the different enemies. I come on I feel something here. My kolama sante karataya. Hey! My soma kasia. If a man decides to arrest people and harvest their organs, they go to places. Children will go to school. They will go and hide somewhere. Or the tofina mabano edi, or the nekono ako harvesting the kidney, and you are telling me that when something like this happen, I must come here and say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What are you talking about? When the guy went to the school, did he not know what he was doing? When he called for the son or the daughter, did he? And towa until it comes to your doorstep. Forgiveness. And loving comes to those who are ignorant. Those who don't know what they are doing. But those who know what they are doing. They are sworn enemies. You don't pray for them. You don't. If you don't understand it, you will confuse yourself. You go and hear somebody say, and now the Christians of today, anytime they are praying, they are praying against their enemies. They are not they, they, they are not matured. Are you more mature than God? In the days of ignorance, the Lord forgave. So, sir, if somebody is troubling my life in ignorance, I can overlook it. In the times of ignorance, do you know what it means to wink? So in the days of ignorance, let me show you say. To win. So in the in Tama Unim Namia Udin Semununi now show where is it? He will overlook. It means he will wink. About Bon and Yacho no trim. Who's will be Din Semuna who do an arm and sign? So in the days where you did not know, when God saw you, he did this. That is why all the bad things we don't know yet. Because if we know, hey, hey Asamaba. God has decided to wink. But watch this. But now. But what? Now. So in the days where you are ignorant, the Lord will overlook. The Lord will forgive you. But now that you have knowledge, he is commanding all men to what? Repentance. Are you following this morning? So an ignorant enemy can be loved into salvation. But a wicked enemy, you cannot love a wicked enemy, a man of wickedness into salvation. Because the Bible said they swore by an oath. The question you ask yourself is, which oath did they swear by? It means that it was a satanic coven and they had their own Bible they used. They had their own commandments they used. 
and by one of their commandments they decided that the life of Paul was their target and the Bible said they added fasting and prayer to it Mary Lehiki is a woman minister and Mary Lehiki said he was sitting in a plane with a guy the flight was about 8 hours throughout the flight the guy didn't eat anything they will bring you will eat if it was you Okay, it's another, it's, that's another day. If it was you in the plane. So when they were stepping out of the plane, he said, praise the Lord. Then the guy said, praise Satan. Then he said, ah, I thought you were Christian. Because, I said, why do you think I'm a Christian? He said, ah, throughout the flight you didn't eat, so I thought you were fasting. I said, yeah, I, I was fasting. But I'm not a Christian, I'm a Satanist. And these are the days we send curses to Christians. So we fast them and curse them. So that they will not prosper. So it's not everybody fasting that is fasting for your good. Even God has enemies. Nahum chapter 1 verse 2. What is this now? God is jealous. Yet God tells us not to be jealous. The Bible says God is what? But then God tells us not to be what? Do you know why? Because we don't owe anything. Jealousy belongs to those who own things. Everything God has given to us, we are stewards. So a steward cannot be jealous. It's the owner. So God can be jealous. We can't because we don't owe anything. Anything we have, we receive from God. Are you following? That is why I said don't be jealous because whatever you have was given. But God can be jealous because, oh, come on now, he owns all things. So the Bible said, God is jealous. And the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. Another word for enemies. And he says, he will reserve. He will reserve. He will reserve his wrath for what? If God has enemies, how much more you? I know why I'm teaching this, this topic because, like I said, many people come and tell me, love your enemy. Which one? If you are matured, you don't pray against your enemies. Where is it written in the Bible that matured men don't pray against their enemies? It's an abhorrent, it's a fallacy of hasty conclusion. Yeah, the last time I was listening to a preacher and he said that, Christians who are praying against their enemies, they are not mature. Where is it written that if you pray against your enemies, you are not mature? Okay, who? If, if, if God is attacking his enemies, am I more mature than God? You see, don't stop. Oh, you see, when you are praying, oh, media, me, 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 one, seven, you know, so for me, 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 we thank God, so you know, but the fact that own drink of one drink, money, you know, does not in any way mean that almost you knew one drink, money. That is the problem. The fact that you don't think evil does not mean your neighbor is not thinking evil. You don't know, yeah, enemies. God has reversed or reserved his wrath for his enemies. So for I don't know why people hate me. I don't, how many people? Have, I don't know why people hate me. Uh, I've not done anybody anything. When I'm doing anything, people are offended. And uh, my, 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 my. even God. Now the question I want to ask is, what did God do wrong for him to have enemies? In the original template of things, God never created an enemy. So enemies come along the way. I'm repeating. In the original prototype of heaven, there is no enemy. But enemies are, are created along. So you can start a relationship with a brother. Along the way, the brother can turn into an enemy. When he turns into an enemy, don't say that because we start. No, because God, when he created the heavens and the earth, he never created any enemy in the up or the low. Along the way, enemies came. So enemies come along the way. That is why nobody was talking ill. So that man said he was going to marry you. That is why you knew that even your aunties never wanted your breakthrough. Enemies come along the way. Is 
If you go to the nightclub and you stay there the whole night, nobody complains. If you start going to all night, they say you are disturbing. Enemies. Everybody was telling you Eradibaye to you put up in a bench. They said Eradibaye. They thought they were prophesying for your. But Eradibaye, you came with a bench. The very moment they saw you that you are no more joining the trotro, enemies have come along. So enemies were not made in Genesis 1. But by the time you got to Genesis 3, enemies had come inside. Akwenam nini a fine pa forget it. Until he saw your breakthrough. Oh, Namia Juma we abrantia iro hu. Until now they saw you and your wife. And they say, yeah, Akwenam za wari ni yiri ni enemies. In your hometown, they are waiting for your coffin. And you, you came in a Bugatti. They are all boxes, but one box is better than the other. They are all containers, but one container, even God. Yeah. Come to church. Your bomb, your bomb, tia. Amen, Lord. Father, we want to thank you very much for your goodness. For your goodness and mercy. <laughs> I'm going to end shortly. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32 verse 45. I'm going to end shortly. Deuteronomy 32 verse 45 or 41 sorry let's do 41 this is the Lord talking on see he said I have with my glittering sword my semicircle for those who don't understand that English there I have with my glittering sword my semicircle for what and my hands take hold on judgment I will render vengeance to my enemies and I will repay those who hate me. Who is talking here? Even God has enemies. Let's continue. Let's continue. Psalm 68 verse 1 is what we started with. Let's continue. Psalm 68 verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let those who also hate him flee from him, before him. Now, this was a direct quote from Numbers 10.35. Let's go to Numbers 10.35. I'm showing you something. <laughs> Numbers 10.35. Watch this. This is how the ark is supposed to move. The ark of God. He said, So it was, whenever the ark set out, that Moses said, Arise up, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let those who hate you flee before. So, anytime they move the act to another level, the prophetic pronouncement was against the enemies of God. Why? Because the enemy is interested in your progress. So, anytime you progress in life, you are supposed to sound a prophetic declaration. That let every enemy of the glory of God be scattered. Nonetheless, you will be in the enemy's camp and the enemy can hijack your ark. Go and ask Hophini and Phinehas. They went to war with the ark and the enemy captured the ark and took it into the gorse of the Philistines because they did not understand that the ark does not move with this. People are moving in glory without warfare. They dance in front of the ark, but they are not prepared for the enemies of the ark. I'm reading it again. He said, So it was 
whenever the ark set out, so you cannot move the ark without this. Moses said, Arise, O Lord. So whenever your children are setting out to go to school, arise, O Lord, and let your enemies. Look at all this. Yeah. You are starting a business. Ubi shop no oh yeah what do they call that thing opening ceremony now with the champagne here there you don't the opponents of the ark they will come so anytime the ark is moving arise oh lord let your enemies so anytime your children are moving arise oh lord let anytime you are going to the bank arise oh have you realized that anytime you put money in the bank, about three or four days after you have a problem, you have to go and take the money to solve? Arise, O oh Lord, and let your enemies what? I don't like your response. It means that Monday, arise, O oh Lord. Tuesday, arise, O oh Lord. Wednesday, arise, O Lord. Thursday, arise, O Lord. Friday, arise, O Lord. Saturday, arise, O Lord. Say, Sunday, you say, all the arising you done in the week, add it up and give me my pay. Yeah. That is why people start businesses, sir, and they fail. Because there's no warfare. Sir, never move without this thing. You are, you, are, you, are, you are going to the embassy. Oh, now for four children, or come to me and say, oh, Jesus, I'm going to call you answer. Hey, bugger. Arise, oh Lord, means God. Go ahead and make sure that anybody that is an enemy of my glory, scatter them. He said, arise, oh God, and let your enemies be hot. Because even God has enemies. <laughs> 